Our scripture reading today comes from the book of John, chapter 6. We'll read verses 35 through 69. The words will be on screen from the New International Version. I invite you to open a device or a Bible to follow along. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and still do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up on the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. At this, the Jews began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up on the last day. Everyone, uh, it, it is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God, and everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while he was teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? The, the, then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The, the Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Yet there are some among you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which one of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve, his closest disciples. And then, Jesus replied, then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the world of the Lord of the Rings, which is not the world of the Bible. It's a very different world. There are these grand adventures and, and cosmic plots, but our eyes in, in these stories are always drawn to these little people, these ordinary people that are called hobbits. And hobbits 
love bread. They love food in all of its forms. They're, they're connoisseurs of every kind of good thing to eat, every meat and mushroom, every bread and beer, every pie and potato, and they hate going hungry. That, that, that's inconceivable for a hobbit. It's the worst thing ever. And, and so when they set out on an adventure or something hobbits never do, they, they take it easy at first. They stop for breaks, they eat, they gather food in the fields, uh, but then in a village of humans, they come to meet this tall human guy called Strider, uh, who agrees to lead them onward to the elves' home. And as they set out through the snowy scrubland, uh, they meet up with, they, uh, they're going along, and Strider never stops. He never rests. He just keeps on striding. The hobbits, on the other hand, want to take a break. Uh, and Strider, also known as Aragorn, uh, turns around when he sees them stop. And they freeze. And, and, and you see uh, Pippin, one of the hobbits, is holding a cast iron pan in one hand. And one of the other hobbits is reaching through his bag to get out some food. They're going to have some breakfast. I, I, Aragorn says sternly to them, Gentlemen, we do not stop until nightfall. And then Pippin, one of the hobbits, says, Well, what about breakfast? And Aragorn says, Well, you've already had it. And then, then Pippin says, oh, We've had one breakfast, yes, but what about second breakfast. I, I'm a big fan of second breakfast, too. Well, Aragorn just, just turns around and keeps walking. He does not even answer Pippin. And then uh, Mary turns to Pippin and whispers to him, I, I don't think he knows about second breakfast, Pip. And Pippin says, well, what about elevensies? Luncheon, afternoon tea, uh, dinner, supper. He, he knows about them, too. And Mary says, I, I wouldn't count on it. These hobbits are hungry. They, they've just started a long journey, but they want familiar food. They want comfort food. They want adventure, yes, but they want adventure with regular snacks and meals throughout the day. They aren't just satisfied with one meal a day early in the morning, so they grumble. And that seems to be a little bit of what's going on here in John 6. See, Jesus has just fed the 5,000 people with these five loaves of bread and two fish. They've had their fill, but somehow once they get back to the city of Capernaum, they're hungry again. And there they meet Jesus. Uh, uh, who, who, he took a shortcut walking uh, across the lake, walking on water. And, and confused, when they get there, they meet Jesus and they ask him for a sign. A sign like bread from heaven. They must be confused, because didn't they just eat bread from heaven, these miracle loaves of wonder bread that Jesus broke and gave? So why are they still hungry? Why doesn't Jesus provide everything they think they need? Well, Jesus explains to them that the manna in the wilderness way back when, that came from God, not from Moses. And, well, they, they already knew that. We heard this manna story last fall when God heard the Israelites grumbling in the desert, how they were running out of food, and he gave them bread from heaven, manna, like these little wafers of honey bread that fell in the morning dew. And the people could gather them and have enough to eat for that day and more than enough when the Sabbath came around, but still they grumbled and complained. And so God sent them flocks of quail in the, in the evening, and they got to eat like kings, plenty of meat and bread every single day, because God gave them enough and more than enough. And beyond bread, God gives them his very presence, which is what they really need, this pillar of cloud and fire right in the middle of their camp. When they most needed it, God gives them himself. And that's the bread from heaven that Jesus is talking about here uh, to the people in Capernaum. The people say, sir, well, always give us that kind of bread. But the funny thing is that Jesus just did. He, he gave them bread on that grassy plain near the mountain. He gave them bread from heaven multiplied to be enough and more than enough for what they needed. But they are still hungry. They still do not understand. And Jesus makes it plain. I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But, but as I told you, you have seen me, and you still don't believe. Well, that explanation from Jesus should make some sense, but it seems to confuse the crowds even more because they start to grumble at Jesus. They grumble just like the Israelites grumbled against God in the desert, 
They, want to go, they wanted to go back to Egypt, back to the, the all-inclusive buffet at the Nile Resort. They wanted to go back to those pots of meat that they sat around in Egypt. They grumble here because they do not understand. They grumble because they think they know Jesus. They think they know his body, his family, that this guy came from Mary and Joseph. This guy can't have come down from heaven, they say, and the grumbling continues, and Jesus calls them out on it. He says, stop grumbling among yourselves. Uh, He explains the whole thing all over again just to help them understand. He says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. Uh, This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Well, the, the crowd jumps on that one word, flesh, that sticks out, and they get stuck on it. They choke on it. They, they argue among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? It, it sounds like cannibalism, frankly, which Christians have been accused of from time to time in various places of the world. Uh, once, when we were missionaries in Laos, someone asked me, do, do Christians really eat human flesh? Because it sure sounds like Jesus says that here. Eat my flesh and drink my blood. And that's what we say when we, when we have communion. This is my body given for you. This is my blood poured out for you. No wonder the Jews and, and the Hmong people in Laos are confused about Jesus. Because many of us sometimes struggle with that same thing sometimes. And when we take communion, we, are we literally eating Jesus' body and drinking his blood? Well, no. It is bread and juice or or wine, but we do believe that the Spirit makes that bread and wine to be for us Jesus' body and blood, that it is a a sign and a sacrament, a a physical thing that points to a deeper Spirit-filled reality. And these physical flesh and blood things are the way that God meets us. It's through these things like bread and wine that we can experience God. But sometimes along the way, what we want is familiar food, comfort food. We're creatures of habit, after all. We're, we're used to what the food we want and, and not this bread from heaven. It, it doesn't sound very satisfying. What about my hunger here and now? What about my needs here and now? What about the things that I use to fill myself instead of the bread of life? How have we grumbled against God in our words or in our deeds? Uh, Do we depend on God's bread of life to satisfy our deepest needs? I suspect many of us feel the Spirit's pull on our hearts uh, to to live rightly based on this story. And, And so Jesus digs a little deeper. He says, this is what I mean by flesh and blood. The I am the bread of life means that you must eat Jesus himself in order to be a part of his life. It's it's this life and death issue, Jesus says. Because in Jesus, we can have kingdom life, life to the fullest, life of the end of the age in the present moment. This is not just about eternal life that happens somewhere, somewhere, sometime long from now. No, this is about our very real and true hope for the resurrection of our bodies at the end of the age so that we may forever be in God's presence. And it's about life here and now, kingdom life, the life that Jesus gives, this bread of life, this flesh and blood. It all comes through participation in Jesus' body. Make sense? Still confused? Good, because this is a mystery. And after all this talk of bread of life and flesh and blood, people are done with Jesus. There's this broader group of Jesus followers who says, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And they continue to grumble among themselves. And Jesus says, does this offend you? Well, yes. Yes, it does. It's too much for some of those followers. And so they leave. They're, They're done with Jesus. And then Jesus clarifies that the life he gives, this flesh and blood and bread, that it comes through the work of the Spirit. Jesus knows that that is, that is much too hard for some of them, and he knows that God draws whom God will to himself, and, and that this pull is a one-way pull. It comes from the Father, by the Spirit, through the Son. And the good news is that Jesus continues to give this bread of life. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And one pastor points out that, this, that Jesus means something by this phrase. It's not just like saying, I am going to the store. 
in Greek, you can say all of that with, without even using the word I, just going and store, basically. Uh, it's all packed into that little verb. But when Jesus says, I am here, he's highlighting it and double underlining it. I am, Jesus says to the woman at the well, like we heard last week, I am the Messiah. I am the Lord, the the great I am, whom Moses met at the burning bush, who revealed himself as the I am who I am, and I will be who I will be, because God is presence. And when Jesus declares himself to be the I am, he is aligning himself with the presence of God, because God is here. Emmanuel, I am here in your midst And the word became flesh, like the flesh and blood that Jesus talks about here, and dwelt among us. I am the bread of life, Jesus says. I am the bread of life because Jesus' presence is revealed in the incarnation. And when we talk about Jesus' body on the cross, about his flesh and his blood poured out, but, but the great I am is this presence at its very core, that Jesus' incarnation reveals God just as much as the crucifixion, that Jesus gives his body and blood for life, for the world, because it's his bodily presence among us that reveals who God is in the flesh. The Israelites ate manna, they ate bread from heaven in the wilderness, says Jesus, but I am the bread of life made flesh among you right now, I give you and I continue to give myself to you. Will you eat? Will you take my life into your life so that you may have life now and always? And the offer is there for the crowd at Capernaum and for the disciples who follow and for those who leave and for those of us here who listen today. Will you receive it? Jesus gives his body the bread of life. Will you take it? Do you hear the Spirit pulling on your heart, drawing you to God the Father through this life-giving body and blood of the Son? This is bread of life. And to all these hard teachings of Jesus, the twelve disciples respond with faith. Simon Peter is the one who speaks for all of them. He says, Lord, To whom shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. In other words, you are the Word. You're the Word made flesh come from God. You're the Word who gives life. You're the bread of life. And in you we have eternal life, the the life of the end of the age, in this life and always. In your kingdom life we have true life. In the Lord of the Rings, there's this special bread of life that people eat. It's called lembas, and it's made by the elves. And they, they, the people on their adventure get this supply of it as they pass through the land of the elves on their way to the dark land of Mordor. And lembas is this bread that elves eat for long journeys. It's a special bread. It's wrapped in the leaves of this tree of life. And it tastes like honey, echoing the, the manna, that the Israelites ate in the wilderness. And one bite of it can be enough to feed a a grown man for a whole day, to fill his stomach. In in fact, at one moment when they first get the bread, Mary turns to Pippin and says, "Uh, how many of those did you eat? And uh, Pippin burps and said, "Uh, four. (laughs) Because the elves are are, are glutton, uh, uh, the, the hobbits are sometimes gluttons. But this lembas bread that they carry goes with them far. It doesn't spoil when it gets wet, when they go through shipwreck and desert and swamp. And this lembas bread carries them even into the land of Mordor, the land of death, where there's nothing to eat. A pastor reminded me of this quote from the books about the power of lembas bread. See, it says this, Tolkien writes, The lembas had this special virtue without which they would have long ago lain down to die. It did not satisfy desire. And at times, Sam's mind was filled with memories of food and the longing for simple bread and meats. And yet, this way bread of the elves had a potency that increased as travelers relied on it alone and did not mingle it with other foods. It fed the will, and it gave strength to endure and to master sinew and limb beyond the measure of mortal kind. 
See, the, the lambas bread keeps the hobbits going when all else would fail. It keeps them going not just by their bodies, but their spirits. It's this bread of life, not a, a comfort food, but something better, something deeper. It gives them strength and will to keep on going in the land of death. It gives them hope. And the, this lembas bread is what sustains them on that long journey. And now, J.R. Tolkien, who wrote these books, was a, a faithful Christian. Though he didn't exactly write these books as an allegory, it's possible sometimes to notice this occasional glimmer of hope and truth and glory. Because Jesus is the bread of life, and he is the one who sustains us for kingdom life. Jesus is the one who gives us energy when all else fails. Jesus is the one who propels us in the moment. His bread is the true life, the, the life of the world, the, the kingdom life, the life of the Spirit that keeps us going here and now for the life to come. And we hope for life, life in this world and life in the life to come. And Jesus is this bread from heaven that comes down, comes down here and now. And he feeds us with his flesh and blood. And he sustains us. And he gives us what we need. He, we become, by eating his bread of life, we become part of his body. And we become part of his death, too, when we take his body in us. And yes, even in his resurrection, too, in that hope of the life to come, because Jesus himself, even now, is sitting in the flesh beside God at the throne. And in the age, in the age to come, in the life of the age to come, when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, then we will have life. And that's why we eat the bread of life. It's why we celebrate, as we did two weeks ago at the communion table, and it's why we share each day that we are drawn into the life of God, into this bread of life of Jesus Christ, into his body and blood. His bread sustains us for life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. O bread of life, come down among us. Jesus Christ, your, by your flesh we are sustained. By your bread we are given strength for the life here and the life to come. To bring the two together by your spirit that we may live as your kingdom people here and now. Sustained by your bread, sustained by your life. That we may be uh, prepared for the life to come. That we may see your kingdom come even here and now we pray. So give us glimpses of that glory. Sustain us by your bread for the life now that we may be your children forever. And for those of us who have not yet taken and tasted that bread, may we taste and see that it is good, that your bread sustains us and gives us strength for what we truly need. It may not be comfort food. It may not be what we think we want, but it is what we most truly need. Give us, we pray, the bread of life, your life in us. Through Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.